Welcome to Forbidden Art. <laughs> Today we are discussing agriculture as displayed in old paintings, although I guess these are not particularly old. We're looking at uh, the painting Harvest in Provence and Wheatfield with Sheaves uh, by Vincent van Gogh. Um, you can see that here, as with a lot of, I guess, older um, depictions of harvests, um, you see that somehow the stalks of the cereal being harvested are bound together in these very characteristic looking bundles uh, that are then, well, sort of lent against each other. Um, the reason they are doing this is, well, you're harvesting the, the stalks with a uh, sickle by hand. And then you have all those stalks and somehow you need to, a way to handle them. And the easiest way is to just bind a couple of them together. And then you have a, I guess, very compact, neat package uh, that you can handle a lot better than the stalks on their own. And these bundles are called sheaves. And that was my presentation. Thank you for your attention. Um, Okay, joke aside, um, there is a reason why I've talked about this, namely the terminology gives us a hint as to the meaning of what we are talking about. Um, but I guess first, let me get to my lecture notes. Um, so what are sheaves and mathematics? Um, they sort of generalize the notion of well, function restriction. Um, well, I guess generalize and formalize, axiomatize the notion that you have functions defined on some open set, and then you can restrict that, that function to a smaller set. Um, and I guess, yeah, definition. So we're not going to talk about sheaves straight away. Uh, we are going to introduce the notion of a pre-sheaf first. Um, a pre-sheaf of C on a category A is a functor A op to C. Or I guess you could just say pre-sheaves are nothing else but contravariant functors. Um, now this of C, uh, I don't really know how to phrase this. Um, the reason I'm, I'm putting it like this is because you usually say a sheaf of sets or a sheaf of groups or a sheaf of K vector spaces, whatever. And so this is sort of the, the target space. And this is why I'm calling this that here. Um, now this is the, I guess, the most general definition, which is not what we are going to use here. We are going to talk about a way more restricted um, thing, namely the notion of a pre-sheaf on a topological space. Um, but we are going to define it in terms of this notion. So somehow we have to make a category out of a topological space first. Um, let X tau be a top space. Uh, we define the category open of X as well, the objects of open are just the open sets or the open subsets of X. So that's our topology tau. And well, I guess not how more of two open subsets U and V is well, something if u is a subset of v and the empty set otherwise. 
or I guess you could just say these sets are, yeah, tau is a partially ordered set, partially ordered by inclusion, and then we just use that prescription I to told you about in the category theory lecture to make that into a category. And now a pre sheaf of C on X is a functor that goes from the opposite category of open um, to C. Uh, what does this mean concretely? Well, we have a functor. A functor does two things. Firstly, a functor associates something to the objects. So for u subset of x open, we have an object uh, f of u, well, in the category c. So if c is like set or group or build, uh, app or field, ring, vector space, whatever, then we just get a set, a group, an abelian group, ring, vector space, whatever. And secondly, if u is a subset of v, is a subset of x, is open, then we have uh, a morphism f of v to f of u. And we call this morphism the restriction from v to u, from the bigger set to the smaller set. And yeah, I guess I'm going to call it restriction from v to u. Although I guess an alternative name that would be quite nice is f of u subset of v. I, I don't know which notation is the more instructive one. And usually when people say just a pre sheaf or something like that, they assume that our category C is the category set. And well, since this is a functor, we also have functor laws to work off of. So the functor laws state that, well, the restriction from u to u is just the identity on fu. Okay, when I restrict to a set that is the same set, it shouldn't change whatever I'm restricting. And secondly, well, if u is a subset of v is a subset of w, then restricting, okay, we restrict from w to v, and then we restrict from v to u, and this should be the same as restricting from w to u straight away. And I guess some bit of terminology, we call fu this set, ring, group, whatever we call this, the sections of f on u. And now we have a whole lot of examples. Um, Firstly, well, we can just say X is a topological space. And then Y is another topological space. 
and then we can define f of u to be the continuous functions from u to y. with the restriction just being the usual restriction. Uh, this is a pre-sheaf of sets. And well, we can sort of go a bit on. Um, if we assume that Y has a bit of extra structure, for example, if, if Y is an abelian group, or I guess a, an abelian topological group, or I guess it doesn't even have to be abelian, then um, F is also a sheaf, a uh, pre-sheaf, sorry, of abelian groups. Or if it is a vector space, topological vector space, then we have a pre-sheaf of vector spaces and so on. Mm -hmm. then we can, I guess the natural continuation of this is uh, let M be a manifold. Uh, we can again define, well, I guess, yeah, we now call our sheaf C infinity. Um, C infinity U are the smooth functions from U to R. Uh, for every open set U and restriction just again being the usual restriction. Um, then C infinity is a pre sheaf of, well, what do we have? C infinity u, well, we can add smooth functions. We can also multiply smooth functions. So we have a pre sheaf of rings. Well, I guess if you want it, we have a pre sheaf of C infinity rings, but uh, let's not talk about that. I, uh, um, similarly, if No, we're not talking about that. Um, now for something more algebraic, uh, let X be the zero set of a bunch of polynomials. Um, so I guess an affine variety. Um, Um, then we have curly O X of U uh, defined this to be the regular functions from U to K. So the functions that can be locally written as a rational function. Uh, again, equipped with the usual restriction as a pre-sheaf of K algebras because we can add regular functions, we can multiply them, but we can also just multiply them, scale them with elements of K. Um, yeah, also note that, of course, we are giving X the Zariski topology
and yeah now for an example that is a bit more i guess a bit more internal to the theory we are looking at um, let capital c be a category um, small c an object uh, define f of any open set to just be c well except that f of the empty set should be a terminal object in whatever category we're looking at so terminal object of capital c and we say the restriction from one open subset to another um, is just the identity on c um, this defines a perfectly valid um, pre-sheaf yeah, and I guess the restriction from any set to the to the empty set is just the unique map uh, from F U to F empty set. Um, this defines a perfectly valid pre-sheaf. Uh, called the constant pre-sheaf is and it's called small c with an underline. I will have to give some power to my laptop. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we see that we can sort of find pre sheaves everywhere in any kind of geometry. We've seen an example from topology, from differential geometry, from algebraic geometry. So it seems to be everywhere. But why do we call it a pre-sheaf and not a sheaf? So somehow we are still missing something that we would like. And um, the problem we have now is that our definition is a bit too too generous, too general, I don't know. Um, it admits a lot of things that we wouldn't like to have. And uh, the thing that it permits, namely, is that we can have, we can lose information when we go to, to small opens or to opens that are too big. Um, so I guess a pathological example. Well, I guess I have even two of them. Um, is well, we have let X be a metric space uh, with metric D, whatever, and then we could define F of U to be well the continuous functions from U to R if the diameter of u is bigger than one or just the zero ring if the diameter is smaller than or equal to one so somehow we have a lot of information but once we go to opens that are have a diameter smaller than one we just lose all of that information and we would just have zero. And I guess conversely, uh, you could define G of U to be, 
well, something very similar could have the ring of uh, of, nat uh, of, of not natural of integers if the diameter is bigger than than one, and then C U R if the diameter is smaller than or equal to one. The reason, by the way, why I'm using Z and not zero is because otherwise we wouldn't have a ring homomorphism. Um, so I chose the zero ring because it's terminal and Z because it's initial in the category of rings. And yeah, so for our example G, we somehow have all of the information about our topological or I guess our metric space if we are looking at very small sets. But as soon as we are going to bigger ones, um, we just lose all of that information. So somehow we need um, we need our our pre-sheaf to play nicely with coverings. Um, and that is exactly what the two sheaf axioms are about. A pre-sheaf f on x with values in c is called a sheaf if it satisfies two axioms. Um, for both axioms, we fix the cover. Uh, let ui with any index set be a cover of an open subset v. And here we, of course, mean an open cover. Um, then our pre-sheaf should satisfy two axioms. The first one is called identity. So if we have, a, if we have two sections, f and g of uh, on v, and we know that on every, uh, for every element of our cover, if we further restrict those two functions uh, and they are equal, uh, then they should be equal overall. So in a way, we say that the function is completely determined on how it looks on an open cover. Sorry, a section is completely determined by how it behaves on an open cover. This should behave for all open covers we can think of, not yes. just for one. We... Yes. Okay. Um, for all V, for all UI. And the second one is called gluing, and I never know if the word gluing contains an E or not. Um, so in this case, we are given a section for every set of our cover. And we have that when we further restrict those, fun uh, those sections on our cover, to intersections. So if we restrict fi from ui to ui um, intersected with uj, um, and that one is always the same as when we restrict fj from uj to ui intersect uj. Um, then we can glue them together. Namely, there is a, a section on 
v such that the fi are just the restrictions. So in a way, what these two axioms say is if I compare the space of sections um, of V on one hand, and on the other hand, I look at the space of sections on each of the UI that sort of agree on overlaps, then the map from one to the other given by, well, restricting to every set is, well, firstly, injective by the identity axiom and secondly, surjective by the gluing axiom. Or put differently, a section is completely determined by what it does on a cover. And secondly, if I have compatible data on a cover, I can always glue them together to obtain a section on V. So examples, well, in that case, we're quite lucky because um, whenever we have our sheaf defined in terms of, or our pre-sheaf is de defined in terms of concrete functions that take values and points, uh, we can always glue them together and the identity axiom always holds. So I guess continuous functions, so, what we had as example one is a sheaf. Um, then smooth functions on a manifold, they also form a sheaf. Uh, thirdly, regular functions on an affine variety always form a sheaf. Then, oof, you could go a lot further. Um, so the three examples we've discussed are all sheaves. What about the fourth example, the constant pre-sheaf? Um, that isn't always a sheaf. Um, if x is connected, then the constant pre-sheaf is a sheaf, otherwise not. Why not? Um, if our set can be written as the disjoint union of two open subsets U and V, then we can choose an element F in C and an element G in C. Well, C in this case is f of u, and this is f of v. Um, on the overlap, they agree, because the overlap is empty. But if f and g are distinct, we can't glue them together. But um, it turns out we can still make this into a sheaf um, that we'll just have to wait for a couple of minutes. Um, now, as I mentioned before, a sheaf is a sort of nice way of bundling a lot of stalks together in a way that makes them all more manageable than each stalk on their own would be. Uh, I guess a natural question is, so what is the stalk in this metaphor? 
and well let f be a pre sheaf on x let p be an element of x uh, then we can define fp to be well we have a space um, of path s and u where u is an open subset of x and the neighborhood of p and where s is a section on u and we divide by an equivalence relation uh, namely a section on u and a section on v are equivalent precisely if there is an open in the intersection of u and v such that when we restrict s to that smaller open it is equal to t restricted to that smaller open so in a way we're looking at functions that are defined or sections that are defined on a small neighborhood around p where we say they are equal if well if we go if we zoom in at some point they are equal and well this is called the stock of f at p and well if u is a neighborhood of p then we have a canonical morphism from fu into fp just given by s is mapped into the equivalence class of the pair su i think you have to say that uh, w needs to contain p as well yes okay thanks and we're going to denote this by also giving our section as in a subscript of p um this particular object is also called the germ of s at p And it just captures the very local behavior of S around P. And I guess I could give one small remark, namely that FP is also an object in C, and it is um, and FP is the co-limit of f u where you go over all the neighborhoods of p Now I've told you what a sheaf is or what a pre-sheaf is, but I haven't really told you what a morphism of pre-sheaves is, a morphism of pre-sheaves. So we are going to remedy that now. A morphism of pre-sheaves F and G. 
is well a natural transformation because we are talking about functors so a morphism between them would naturally be a natural transformation um yeah eta from f to g um but what does it look like concretely so it means I E for every open set in X, uh, we have a morphism eta U going from F U to G U. And we want it to play nicely with restrictions, namely for uh, V subset of U subset of X, we want um, well, we can go from FU to GU. And we can also restrict to V. But we can also restrict on the other side, but now in the pre sheaf G. Um, but then we can again map using eta, and we want this to commute. Okay, it doesn't seem like too big of a definition. And secondly, a morphism of sheaves is just a morphism of pre sheaves. So we get no extra condition except that both the source and the target be also sheaves. And, well, I guess you already guessed it. Um, this all makes pre-sheaves on X and pre and sheaves on X into categories. And we call those categories of X with, I guess, values in C and just Okay, so we have talked about sheaves, uh, sorry, we've talked about morphisms of free sheaves or sheaves, and we've talked about stalks as two sort of unrelated concepts. So the question is now, um, what do they have to do with each other? And uh, we have a theorem about this, uh, namely, if we have a morphism of free sheaves, um, then it induces a morphism on the stalks. Um, and we can just write down what it does. Uh, we call that morphism eta p going from the p stock of f to the p stock of g. 
and we are mapping a section just to well, what would happen if we applied eta to that section? And then I guess we take equivalence classes. Because every, uh, every germ is somehow induced by a local section, we can just take the open on which that section is defined and then just apply eta for that open. And the fact that we have a morphism of pre-sheaves, so it is compatible with the restrictions. Um, because of that, we have that our morphism on the stalks is well defined. And I guess our the, the more important takeaway, why this is called a theorem, is if f and g are sheaves. then our morphism eta is determined, completely de determined by what it does on all of the stalks. Um, proof basically just uses um, a lot of identity and a lot of gluing to give us exactly what we want. And I don't know, it's probably not that insightful. But we need this result for our big construction. Namely, we want to somehow um, think of a way how we can turn Pre sheaves into sheaves, and well, we want we want some form of um, some form of um, mm, some form of property for those sheaves that we construct. Um, and in order to formulate those properties, we we need this this thing. Um, So assume we have a pre sheaf F. Uh, we want to construct a sheaf F sharp um, such that it satisfies a, a certain property such that any sheaf, uh, any pre-sheaf morphism that originates on F can be continued or can be uniquely continued to a sheaf morphism um, eta sharp um, that goes from F sharp to G um, where we assume that G is a sheaf. Or put differently, we want the morphisms from uh, the sheaf morphisms from F sharp to G be naturally isomorphic to the pre sheaf morphisms from F to G, where we forget about the fact that G is a sheaf. So I guess you could call it G flat. Um, where this is sort of the forgetful functor. Um, that just forgets about the sheaf structure. Um, the reason why I am give this, um, this isomorphism here, or 
the reason why I write it down this way is because if you sort of view the 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 more here as an inner product, this looks a lot like sharp should be adjoint to flat. And well, yeah, um, sharp is adjoint to flat. Um, because, well, that is actually a categorical notion that I didn't really get to talk about during the category theory lecture. Um, but yeah, it exists. It's called adjointness, or I guess sharp is left adjoint to flat. And uh, yeah, I don't know. The question is so, how do we construct this sharp? thingy. Um, so the first try might be, well, we have, we have seen that a sheaf morphism is determined by what it does on the stalks. So we could just say that F sharp of U is just, okay, we just take all of the stalks, just take the product of all of the stalks. Um, that thing certainly has the same stalks as F. And we could define, well, when we now have a morphism eta, um, we could define eta sharp on the stalk of P to just be eta p. I don't know why I put an argument there. But the question is, OK, we could define those stalks here, the, the action of eta sharp on the stalks. But does that actually give us a sheaf morphism that, that actually maps to G? We have seen that sort of a morphism eta gives us, or I guess a morphism eta sharp, gives us a whole bunch of maps eta sharp P. But we haven't really looked at in which case we can take a whole lot of eta sharp P and glue them together to a morphism eta sharp. Um, so, but do they glue, do they determine, do they actually determine a sheaf morphism? Oh, what I forgot to mention, um, when you define F-sharp in that way, you can just take your restriction to be the restriction. And then it's just like the, the functions we've looked at earlier, the, she, uh, the sheaves of functions. Um, so this definition would, of course, give us a sheaf. But does this sheaf really have this property? Or aren't there potentially more sheaf morphisms than pre-sheaf morphisms? Or are, they poten are there potentially more sheaf morphisms on this side? than pre-sheaf morphisms on that side or vice versa. And the, yeah, I guess the problem is that um, we are actually not sure that they glue nicely. So the answer is no. Um, we've picked our F sharp way too, uh, way too fine, way too, large, I guess. Um, because in that case, like, this is sort of, mm -hmm, how should I put this? 
um, the way we defined this here doesn't really care about the topology. Um, if we just picked the discrete topology on X, we would get the same thing. So this would be akin to, we wanted to have continuous functions, but this thing here just stores the value at every point. So those are just functions. Um, so we need to have some sort of congruence relation or coherence relation between the stalks. And or put differently, I guess the, the stalks of neighboring points need to somehow be related or something. Um, if we want to have smooth sections or whatever sections. Um, so, oh God, this definition is really gory, but I guess I'll have to do it. So, next attempt. Okay, we again start by having by defining it as the elements are still products of stalks. So the first step doesn't really change. But now we want some sort of coherence condition. We say the sections are tuples of stalks such that for every point in U, there exists a neighborhood of a point and a section of F such that for all Q in that neighborhood, um, our Xi Q is equal to SQ. Or put differently, we take stocks but we want them, or we pick a tuple of stalks, but we want to have them be locally, uh, we want to have them locally be the stalks of sections. So that in a way, we are not completely oblivious to the fact that a sheaf is not just a collection of stalks, um, but that we actually have some coherence condition to them. And it turns out this works completely nicely. Um, we call F sharp the sheafification of F. And don't ask me what that's called in French because I can't even imagine it. <laughs> Fessoification. <laughs> In Dutch, it's called Fesschroving because sheaf is called Schroof. Um, I guess the reasonable question would be so remember that constant pre sheaf that wasn't actually a sheaf usually. So what does its sheafification look like? Well, first thing to note, um, what do the stalks look like? Well, if we take the stalk, we take some co-limits of smaller and smaller opens that are always non-empty. So we just take the co-limit of just C all the time. So that's just C. And here we notice, oh uh, no, let's not do that yet. Um, so when we go strictly by definition, we have um, the sections, well, since they go into a product of always the same thing, we can just write this as functions from U to C. 
in Z, um, such that for every P in U, there exists an open neighborhood and a section, or I guess an element T in C, such that for all elements Q of that neighborhood, S of Q is equal to T. Or put differently, our function S is locally constant. And that is precisely why, well, this is exactly how we see that um, if we take the sharp away, then we don't have a sheaf because locally constant functions can have different values on different connected components. And if there's just one, then locally constant means constant. So it is actually the same thing. Um, and then I guess in this way, this thing is called the locally constant sheaf. And it is also denoted by C with a bar below it, because usually you, are not, you aren't that interested in free sheaves. So yeah, we usually just talk about this thing as a sheaf. And here we also see that if we had taken our first definition um, or our first try at sheafification, then oh, then C sharp of U would just be every function from U to C. So by introducing this coherence condition, we've really made our space a lot smaller. And I guess this thing here also has a name. It's called the Italy space. Um, or I guess, on l'appelle l'espace Italy. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, okay, so now after the break, let's do some geometry. Um, I guess the first thing I could note is a sheaf of commutative rings. is called a ring space. Um, and a, a sheaf of commutative rings were all uh, <laughs> where all stalks are local rings is called a locally ringed space. And ultimately, all of differential geometry, algebraic geometry, whatever, can be formalized in terms of these locally ringed spaces. Um, but this is actually a bit too much, um, a bit too complicated, a bit too many definitions. We're going to do something much easier. Um, so I guess the above two definitions were just for completeness. And if you want to read up on stuff, you are eventually going to land on locally ringed spaces. Um, 
but I'm going to introduce a, a slightly simpler notion, um, namely the notion of a K space. Let K be a field. So R or C or the completion of Q or whatever field you can think of, periodic numbers, FP, FP squared, whatever. Um, a K space. Yeah, by the way, if you try to Google this, you're not going to find anything. Um, I haven't found anything about this on the internet. K space is a tuple XOX where X is a topological space. And OX is, well, not a sheaf of rings, but a very specific sheaf of rings is a subsheaf of the sheaf of functions x to k. Um, what does this mean? Um, it means, well, firstly, OX is a sheaf of k algebras and well, every section is a function on that open set that takes values in our field k. And we have no requirements of continuity or anything. Um, yeah, it's a sheaf of k algebras. And um, we call OX, the structure sheaf. Because those functions that we associate with every open set, they more or less define whatever structure we want on our space. Um, and what we mean of by structure, um, we will come to that in a bit. And well, I've given you a new kind of object. So what is a morphism? A morphism F X O X to Y O Y of K spaces. Is a continuous map. Um, F, yeah, from, sorry, where is it? There. Continuous map from X to Y, such that for every open of Y, and for every section, um, if we pick, if we compose that section with F, we get another section, and this time of X. So you could say a morphism is a continuous map that preserves or respects the structure that we give to that space via the structure sheaf. Inverse of f of u, isn't it? Not y, not the last one. Yeah, thanks. And we call this category, well, I haven't really found a name for it because there isn't, there isn't anything on the internet about it, um, but I guess you could call it 
KSP. Um, and now we can introduce a whole bunch of examples. Um, firstly, Let U be an open subset of uh, N times non-negative numbers to the nth power, or I guess that um, And we define OU of V to be continuous functions from V to R. Um, oh, should be zero there. Um, yeah, I've given them a whole bunch of names now. Those names are non-canonical, and I just came up with them. Um, so this uh, then U O U is a uh, such a is an is an R space, and R space is isomorphic. to one of these are called topological Euclidean spaces. And then second example, Let again you be a subset, an open subset of that same thing. Yeah, I guess we could call them topological Euclidean spaces with m corners, but never mind, I guess. Um, and we define OUV to be. Uh, the functions from V to R that can be continued on a slightly bigger open subset of R to the N uh, to a CK function. So K times differentiable. Um, where I guess k is a natural number or infinity or omega. Um, then again, u o u is an R space and R spaces blah, 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 isomorphic to this one are called CK Euclidean spaces. Um, I guess you could call this example to be. Um, we can now do this whole thing with complex numbers. Let U be a subset of CN. And O U V B holomorphic functions uh, V to C um, then U O U is a C space and uh, and C space is isomorphic to this one are called 
holomorphic Euclidean spaces. And yeah, I guess example three should be more familiar. Let K be an algebraically closed field. I uh, subset of Kx1 to Xn be a reduced ideal, not reduced, radical. Um, and you be the zero set of that ideal um, equipped with the risky topology. And we define O U of V to be the regular functions. Um, from V to K. Then, oh, sorry, U, O, U is a K space. And K spaces isomorphic to this one are called affine K varieties. And yeah, I guess another example internal to our theory, if X O X is a K space and U is an open subset of X, uh, then we can just restrict our structure sheaf to U and this is again a K space. So yeah, we can take subspaces. It works. Similar definition also exists for closed subsets, but then you would have to, it's a bit more complicated. Well, anyway, um, And now that we've defined all of those nice examples, what can we do with those examples? Well, we can define a whole lot of new things with them. So a topological CK smooth or analytic manifold Um, I guess with M corners is an R space that can be covered by topological or CK or smooth or analytic Euclidean spaces. Secondly, or I guess that's as example to be a complex manifold is a C space that can be covered by holomorphic Euclidean spaces.
And I guess the thing you've all been waiting for, a variety is a case space, well, I guess a K variety is a case space that can be covered by affine varieties. And well, I have given you a whole bunch of new objects. What are the morphisms? A, oh, this is going to be a long one. Map of topological manifolds or a CK map or a smooth map or an analytic map or a holomorphic map. or a morphism of varieties. Is a morphism of uh, uh, <laughs> C or K spaces. Okay, so why? <laughs> so the thing we are doing, okay, maybe I should Okay, the reason why we are considering case spaces is because they are way easier to work with than locally ringed spaces. Because if you have a locally ringed space, you would need to provide, uh, for a morphism, you would need to provide a continuous map of the spaces and then a morphism of the sheaves. And since the sheaves don't necessarily have anything to do with the spaces beneath them, like it could theoretically be any map. So you need to provide a lot of data for them. If on the other hand, you're working with a sheaf that is explicitly defined as containing functions on that open subset, then we can just define our actions on the sheaves or on the, yeah, on the sheaf of rings um, by composition with that map on the underlying spaces. So we can get away by just giving you a map from one uh, topological space to another topological space. Um, in another, I guess, more categorical way, um, well, not really. Um, but this is just the thing about case spaces in general. Um, note that K itself, sorry the category of k spaces has a terminal object namely the set that contains just one point together with a sheaf that assigns to that one point k and the empty set to the empty set uh, this thing is a terminal object uh, it's terminal in k spaces um, and in particular, wait, is it though? Oh yeah. Then my point becomes useless. Um, yeah, it's probably not correct, but at least for varieties and for manifolds, you can give the field itself, the structure of a case space. So R is a manifold. No shit. C is a complex manifold. K is a variety because it's just A1. Um, and in that way, 
our structure sheath is just giving you the set of morphisms from your open set to K. So what the structure sheath is doing is that it says, okay, we have some, some structure and I give you that structure by specifying how you can map to the field. And in some, uh, in some way, that field is somehow determines all of the structure. Um, I guess the more practical reason why I'm doing this is that the, uh, I guess, first lemma, we can do the functor from a, the category of manifolds to the category of R spaces is co-continuous. meaning that it preserves co-limits. Um, similarly for any other kind of manifolds to R spaces or complex manifolds to C spaces or varieties to K spaces. And the much more important fact is that any category of K spaces just has all the co-limits. Um, I don't know, would you like me to provide the, the concrete construction because this is actually quite an easy thing to prove. Why not? Okay. Um, okay, to be fair, this thing about this map being co-continuous is mostly that, um, I mean, I haven't proven it, but it seems I, I've read something along those lines. I'm not really sure how to prove it. Well, I guess you could just prove that it preserves co-equalizers and co-products and that's it. Well, never mind. We are going to construct co-limits. Um, for the second thing, uh, let I be a small category. Uh, F from I to K space be a functor, and then we define x to be, well, we take the product over all of the objects, and we say that they should be compatible under the morphisms um, f of f of xi should be xj. So when we have, I don't know, like a, a diagram like that, and that just means that I don't know, things should work out nicely. Um, or that like it, it should be Yeah, I don't know. The the prime example for this is taking like a fiber coproduct and then it's just the 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 fibered bit uh, is here. Um, and well, this is a nice space. What topology do we give to it? Well, we give it the final topology. Or in other words, we take the co-limit of the diagram in the category of topological spaces. And we say, 
OX of U should be made up of those functions from U to K such that for every I an I F composed with the projection to I should be contained in the structure sheaf of Fi. So where the projection just maps from the product of all of the Fi to, yeah, I guess should make this into a J to Fi. And well, OX is a sheaf, blah, 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 XOX is a case space. And we've defined it precisely such that all of those projection maps are actually morphisms of case spaces. So that one is the co-limit of F. And yeah, I guess checking that it is indeed the co-limit is a bit tedious. So I'm going to skip it here. So I guess a big annoyance with dealing with manifolds is that you only have finite dimensional manifolds. Like a priori, you wouldn't know how to define infinite dimensional manifolds. Um, but one way to construct at least some infinite dimensional manifolds is as a co-limit of other manifolds. Um, again, the co-limit, um, well, if it, is in, if it is an infinite dimensional manifold, the co-limit co obviously doesn't exist in the category of manifolds but it exists in the category of case spaces. And the fact that our forgetful functor is co-continuous means that co-limits and manifolds are always the same as co-limits in, in R spaces, except that in R spaces you have more co-limits. So um, this gives us sort of a notion of uh, or a way of extending the notion of a manifold. Um, so I guess one example we could look at, um, we have our index set being the natural numbers and we define f of n to be rn and the restriction map uh, for m or not the restriction map, but just the map for n is smaller than m um, is just the map given by, um, well, x is extended by a bunch of zeros. So yeah, I guess. I is the category where the objects are natural numbers and the morphisms are like something when the number is bigger or smaller than the other one. So it is the category made from N as a poset. And then we can take the co-limit of F. Um, and this thing has as topological space um, the space the set uh, infinitely long tuples um, where only finitely many entries are non-zero.
So I guess um, you could call it R to the N with finite support or something. Um, usually it's called R infinity. And that's uh, one very mild example for an infinite dimensional manifold. Well, it's not a manifold in the narrow sense, but it is a co-limit of manifolds and therefore still has a lot of the nice properties of manifolds. It looks like the polynomial ring in n variable. In a way, yeah. Except that the polynomial ring is a ring and you would need to give it a topology. And this thing here, well, of course it has an obvious ring structure, but that's a different one. Um, but also keep in mind that um, we shouldn't just say sort of generalized manifolds are co-limits of, manifold of manifolds in general, because there are also pathological cases. For example, if we take this diagram, um, where this thing is the constant zero map and the constant zero map, um, this thing also has a co-limit in, uh, in R spaces um, and it's called the wedge, wedge product, no, the, the V product, I guess, of R and R. Um, this shouldn't really be a manifold. Um, under any circumstance, because what does it look like? looks like one copy of R glued to another copy of R in one single point. So at this point, it has dimension one. At this point, it has dimension. Um, I guess another way to put this is that, well, if you wanted to think about it in terms of varieties, that would be the variety of x times y, um, which isn't irreducible. So it has points that are not smooth. OK. And now we could go the other way and ask, what about limits? Um, because I want to take infinite products. I don't want to have this, this R infinity where still for every element, only finitely many entries can be non-zero. I want to have a proper infinite dimensional manifold. Mm. But the thing is, I don't think that the forgetful functor is continuous. I mean, I've looked at it and yeah, I just doubt it is even the, the minimum amount of continuous. So um, although the category of case spaces also happens to have all the, of the limits, um, that is probably just not useful. Um, but what we could do is go another step and will not only associate to every open set the scalar fields, if you want, on that map, but maybe also the curves into that um, into that set. And well, you would be hard pressed to make that into a sheaf because like you can't really glue curves, at least I, I wouldn't know how to do that uh, because the, the gl whole gluing operation is always about the domain and not the codomain. Well, anyway, you could do a similar definition that you just associate with every space, the set or the sheaf or whatever of all scalar fields and of all curves. And then you would have them be determined by each other. 
And then you could probably, or no, then you can surely define um, manifolds inside of that category. And blah, blah, um, those things are called Fröhlicher spaces. Um, or convenient spaces, I think, and are one of the go-to methods of really defining infinite dimensional manifolds, where you then also have the nice property of um, C infinity from one manifold to another manifold, also being a manifold. Uh, so in other words, you have a Cartesian closed category or what, whatever and everything is just nice um, but that is way beyond the scope of this um, <laughs> so i guess that's it for today